This is the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio Program. I am your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to listen in today. Hey, if you're a new listener, this is where we talk about the conditions and events that exist that might affect your retirement. And if you are a new listener, I'd like to invite you to get my 2024 forecast issue of my January special report. If you go to requestyourreport.com, I'll be glad to drop the forecast in the mail to you. Uh, You'll get my forecast for stocks, bonds, gold, and the U.S. economy. And when you go to requestyourreport.com, I'll not only send you the 2024 forecast issue, I will also send you a copy of my newly revised revenue sourcing book, for 2024. The revenue sourcing book contains uh, strategies and techniques that you might consider moving ahead in 2024 to help you achieve your dreams of a comfortable, stress-free retirement. So I want to talk a bit in this segment about economic data and the way economic data is reported. Certainly, it is confusing. There was an article published this past week on January 17th that reported that retail sales were up month over month from November to December 0.6%. So retail sales up 0.6%. Does that mean that we have healthy U.S. consumers? They're out spending more money. Uh, Is that a reflection of the fact that we had holiday shopping maybe in December? Or what exactly does that mean? Because on the surface, it really means that, hey, it looks like the economy is doing pretty well. And it's really important that we have retail sales, that we have consumers out there spending money because the U.S. economy is more than 70% dependent on consumer spending for its economic health. Now, the inflation data also came in. When you look at the official inflation rate measured by the Consumer Price Index, you see that month over month, inflation was up 0.3%. Now, the Consumer Price Index, for those of you that maybe are new listeners once again, is a number that does not really reflect the actual inflation rate. When we think about inflation, we think about what does it cost to go out and buy uh, a dinner out? What does it cost to buy a magazine or take out pizza or a haircut or a, a visit to the doctor's office? And if you look at what the real inflation rate is, there is a private index that's called the Chapwood Index. And the Chapwood Index calculates the inflation rate by examining the cost of 500 different consumer items in 50 different metropolitan areas around the United States. Now, if you look at the Chapwood Index and you look at different parts of the country, you'll find that, not surprisingly, New York and Los Angeles have inflation rates when looking at the price of actual consumer items that you buy over the last five years, averaging between 13 and 14 percent. Now, if you take a look at Houston or Philadelphia or Phoenix, it's between 10 and 11 percent. Overall, though, When you look at consumer items, the average annual inflation rate in the U.S. over the past five years has been 12%. Now, I know many of you listening to today's broadcast are familiar with the Law of 72. The Law of 72 is a simple math formula that tells you how long it takes for an investment to double or, when calculating the inflation rate, how long it takes prices to double. And the law of 72 is really simple to execute. If the average annual real inflation rate is 12%, you take 72 divided by 12, and it takes six years for prices to double. Well, that tells you that if the average annual inflation rate over the past five years is closer to 12%, when looking at the actual cost of consumer items, it tells you that prices have almost doubled over the past five years. And that really feels a lot closer to reality for those of us that do our weekly grocery shopping or go to the doctor's office or have priced other consumer items. So that 0.3% that 
that the consumer price index increase from November to December is skewed downward because the consumer price index has several adjustments, dare I say manipulations, that make the reported inflation rate look more favorable. So my point is simply this. Is retail spending up? Are are consumers out there buying more? Or are they paying more for what they have to buy? I would argue that it's probably more the latter than it is the former. If you're going to go out and buy certain items and it costs more and you have to have it, that's going to make the retail sales number seem greater than it is. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, here on the program and uh, in all of our newsletters and all of our special reports, the books that we publish, our goal is to help you sort through the economic data, help you sort through the investing markets, help you figure out how to achieve your dreams of a comfortable, stress-free retirement with the highest probability. Now, the Federal Reserve has told us in December that now rate cuts are back on the table. Easy money is back on the table. Well, if we still have inflation, and arguably inflation is not under control, it's my forecast that in 2024, we are likely going to see more inflation. And if you want some information about how to potentially protect yourself, I'd invite you to get our free Precious Metals Buyer's Guide. You can get that by going to plpmetals.com. That is P as in Papa, L as in Lima, P as in Papa, plpmetals.com. And let us know where to mail your Precious Metals Buyer's Guide, and we'll be very glad to send you that information absolutely free. Now, when you start taking a look at other economic data that's reported, the unemployment rate is very favorable. The current unemployment rate is coming in officially at under 4%. Well, when you hear that and you hear that retail spending is up, you would say, wow, the economy is doing pretty well. Well, when you dig into those jobs numbers, you might come up with a different conclusion. Mr. M.N. Gordon wrote a piece this past week, an op-ed piece, and he starts by asking, did you see the recent government propaganda from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics? Strong words. He said, not the latest faulty claim that consumer prices increased at an average annual rate of just 3.4%, but rather that 216,000 jobs were added in December, end quote. You see, every time jobs are reported, they typically, recently anyway, have been revised down. The October new jobs report was revised downward later by 45,000 jobs in just one month. The November jobs report was revised downward by 26,000. So between October and November, that's 71,000 jobs that were originally reported as being created that now, after the downward revision, we find out did not exist. So the question, of course, is how many of the 216,000 jobs in December will actually exist in a couple months after these downward revisions take place? Now, there's also the whole issue when you when it comes to jobs reporting that part-time jobs and full-time jobs are reported the same way. If you have somebody working more than one job because one job doesn't pay the bills, those two jobs are reported as two jobs created, even though it's the same work person working both of them. Now, I'll talk more about that in the fourth segment of today's program. Joining me in the next segment is my special guest today, Mr. Murray Gunn. He is the head of global research at Elliott Wave International. Uh, I'll get Murray's forecast for financial markets and talk to him about this fascinating science, socionomics. Let me remind you, if you're just tuning in, I do have available for you my 2024 forecast issue of my January special report. To get a complimentary copy of my 2024 forecast for stocks, bonds, gold, and the U.S. economy, simply visit requestyourreport.com and I'll be glad to get it in the mail to you. I'll be back after these words with my special guest, Mr. Murray Gunn.
Welcome back to RLA Radio. I am your host, Dennis Tuberg, and joining me on today's program once again is returning guest, Mr. Murray Gunn. If you are a longtime listener to RLA Radio, you'll recognize Murray as the head of global research at Elliott Wave International. Uh, Elliott Wave is uh, one of the world's premier subscription-based market and uh, economic analysis firms. Um, I follow their work, and you can learn more about their work at ElliottWave.com. And uh, also a, a very uh, interesting and unique science, Socionomics. We'll talk about that in the second segment today with Murray. You can learn more there at Socionomics.net. And uh, Murray, welcome back to the program. Thank you uh, very much, Dennis. It's great to be here, and uh, Happy New Year to you and uh, your listeners. Well, thank you so much, and Happy New Year to you as well. So, Murray, just jumping right in here, for our listeners, we've got a, an ever-growing audience here. So for our listeners that may not be familiar with what Elliott Wave is, could you give them maybe uh, just a one-minute primer on Elliott Wave? Sure. Well, the uh, Elliott Wave principle is uh, what we call uh, a fractal-based model of the economy. And it was discovered by a man called Ralph Elliott in the 1930s. So what he discovered was that uh, human herding behavior uh, causes markets like this stock market, which is a leading indicator of the economy, to uh, exhibit certain uh, identifiable and repeatable patterns. Uh, and what he found was that these patterns repeat at every time scale. And so uh, it enables cycles of herding behavior, human herding behavior, to be anticipated from the short term to the very long term. And what he did, um, uh, he, he didn't come with any sort of theory. He was an accountant by profession, so he came with that sort of mindset. And he examined uh, price data for the U.S. stock market, and this, so this empirical study discovered that these patterns could be labelled uh, and identified, um, and, and that introduced a, a, a forecasting element to market analysis that was previously not really uh, appreciated. So, for example, if there's a, a triangular uh, price pattern on the chart of the stock market, it's a fairly reliable indicator of what's going to happen next when the pattern is uh, complete. And, and obviously the fact that these patterns repeat at every time scale means that the Elliott Wave principle can be used to forecast price developments for the next few hours or even the next few years or, or even you know longer. So if the if your listeners go to ElliottWave.com, they can get a, a huge amount of resources which explains uh, our process in, in much greater detail. Well, thank you for that explanation, Murray. And if you're just joining us, my guest today is the head of global research at Elliott Wave International, Mr. Murray Gunn. So, Murray, based on the fact that, you know, Elliott Wave is a forecasting tool, there are a lot, there's a lot going on around the world. You know, when you look at things from a fundamental perspective and a geopolitical perspective, uh, the BRICS coalition now has expanded, adding uh Saudi Arabia is probably the most uh, interesting uh, country that, that joined BRICS. Uh, so what what are your charts telling you? What is Elliott Wave telling you as far as currencies moving ahead? Uh, do, do, do you have any forecasts for our listeners? Well, in, in strictly in terms of currencies, uh, what the uh, Elliott Wave analysis is uh, pointing to uh, for this year really is a, a good chance of the dollar, the US dollar uh, depreciating in value against um, many uh, major currencies. Uh, the one one pattern that, that really stands out is the, the dollar against the, uh, the British pound. And um, obviously it doesn't really work very well on radio, but I can't show the chart. But uh, if I can just describe the, over the last few years, over the last decade, there's been a a downward movement in sterling dollar, so an appreciating dollar. Um, and that actually traced out what we call in LA Wave terms uh, an ending diagonal pattern. And what's really interesting about those patterns is that um, they normally end with some sort of dramatic uh, event. And so when uh, the dollar appreciated 
towards uh, parity with the British pound um, last year. Uh, that was when you had the um, what has become famously known as the Cami quasi budget from the uh, from the UK government, where they basically uh, announced unfunded tax cuts and the market panicked and you know the bond yields went up and and uh, there was a huge panic uh, and that marked the low point of sterling uh, dollar. Also, actually, I should mention at that point there was the famous uh, or. Uh, what we call the, the BBC indicator. So that's the, the British broadcasting company, the, the national broadcaster for the UK. Uh, so the pound, the, the, the fall in the pound had become the main headline on their news. And, and when that happens, it's usually a sign that, uh, you know, it's gone to an extreme. So um, last year we saw the extreme in, in sterling dollar um, and it's been rallying since, and it really looks like it's going to continue to uh, rally, meaning an appreciating pound uh, and weakening dollar. Uh, and that's the same for uh, really euro dollar as well. So an appreci appreciating euro against the, the dollar and dollar yen. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, we've had we've finished with a dramatic uh, sort of rise in dollar yen over the last uh, few years. Uh, again, based on a, a, an Elliott wave pattern, we're looking at uh, the yen appreciating uh, versus the, the the dollar. So, Murray, would it be fair to say, based on that Elliott wave forecast, then, if you're a U.S. citizen listening to this radio program, if you're doing business every day using U.S. dollars, uh, do you have more inflation to look forward to? Well, certainly the, the, the consumer price inflation, um, and that, that's obviously what people refer to as inflation. Uh, and, and it's actually, it's, actually the, it's not the strict definition of inflation. I mean, inflation really is, is in terms of money and credit in the economy. So um, when, the, when the Federal Reserve, when the Bank of England, when the European Central Bank were, were printing all these, all these euros and, and, and pounds and dollars, um, over the last decade in quantitative easing and after the pandemic, that was that was hyperinflation in, in, in many respects. But anyway, of course, that, that kind of, you know, a lot of times that feeds through to consumer prices as well. Um, now, that process is, is being reversed now in terms of the quantitative easing. So money money is, is, is basically deflating, uh, which is having some sort of impact on consumer prices. But really, the main um, driver of consumer prices, we think, over the next couple of years is probably going to be uh, commodities. And uh, it does look like uh, commodities have not uh, have actually only started their, their, their rise in, in many commodities. You had that uh, you know, historic low in, in, if you look at commodities on an index basis, like the, the Commodities Research Bureau Index, uh, it had reached an historic low just before the um, the pandemic, and uh, you know after that it had this uh, amazing rise. Now, from an Elliott Wave perspective, that rise, that that rally in, in the uh, the advance occurred in uh, five waves, and um, so the, the advance can be broken down into into a five wave movement. And once when when that happens from a significant low point. That means that it's just the initial wave of a much bigger movement. So we're getting this um, retracement now in in a lot of commodities. They're 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 sort of going sideways to down. What we call a retracement. So we're counting that as really sort of the second wave. And then once that finishes, there'll be a third wave higher in commodities. So certainly, the, the, from that respect, there will be continued um, upward pressure on consumer prices. So, Murray, when you talk about commodities, would it be fair to say that we're talking about, you know, agricultural commodities? We're also talking about, uh, you know, metals like gold and silver. Uh, are you expecting uh, uh, that, that we'll see increases in uh, in all those markets moving through 2024? Well, there are some uh, there are some uh, d uh, differentiators. I mean, something like oil, we, from an Elliott Wave perspective, we see, see oil more as kind of sideways to down. Uh, but things like copper, uh, that looks uh, you know long term bullish. 
which would obviously fit with the kind of green transition. And um, yeah, gold are, are uh, what we call our wave count. So it's the, the Elliott wave analysis. Uh, the, the wave count on gold at the moment looks actually quite uh, quite bullish. So um, we expect uh, gold and silver to, to move up during the course of this year. And what's interesting about that, and certainly in terms of gold, is that it's probably going to be um, the fifth wave of of the pattern uh, going up um, of a of a higher what we call a higher degree, a longer term pattern. And what happens with commodities uh, often is that when you get a fifth wave, uh, it can be really dramatic and and, and extend quite a quite a long way. Um, because the fifth waves in commodities for things like uh, metals and gold, they tend to be driven by the psychology behind that tends to be driven by kind of fear. You know, it's not like in the stock market where you get the a fifth wave in the stock market going up. That's kind of greed that, that drives that. There's the psychology driving that. In gold, on a fifth wave advance, it tends to be fear. So, you know, might tie in with other geo- geopolitical things that we could talk about later um, uh, in, in gold, but it certainly looks bullish at the moment. Well, Murray, we have about a minute and a half left in this segment. Uh, where does your Elliott Wave analysis see the major stock indices going in 2024? Well, um, there are there are exceptions for uh, you know example in, in in some emerging markets and some you know far eastern markets, but in general for the major uh, markets we see stocks going down uh, this year, and um, based on uh, the Elliott Wave analysis uh, first and foremost, but there's also something that's happening at the moment in the uh, U.S. stock market which is very interesting. It's uh, It's um, uh, what we call a Dow theory non-confirmation. And so Charles Dow, when he was, uh, you know, writing about the stock markets and uh, his writings became known as Dow theory, um, where he he founded the Wall Street Journal and uh, he wrote about all the markets in the Wall Street Journal. Um, What he discovered was that for the market to be healthy, that the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Dow Jones uh, Transportation Average, they have to be making new highs together. And what's happened now is that the, the uh, Industrials uh, Average has made a new high, but the Transports is nowhere near to making uh, a new high. So that's why we get this, what they call a non-confirmation. And that points to uh, a kind of wonky market, an, an unhealthy uh, market. Um, now, the last time this occurred really was just before the, the uh, 2020 uh, crash in the stock market, and it also happened uh, before the 2008 uh, crash as well. So it's it's certainly something to be uh, cognizant of uh, as we move through uh, the next uh, few weeks and months. Well, my guest today is Mr. Murray Gunn. He is the head of global research at Elliott Wave International. The website is ElliottWave.com. I'll continue my conversation with Murray Gunn when RLA Radio returns. Stay with us. I'm Dennis Tubergen. You're listening to RLA Radio. My guest on today's program is Mr. Murray Gunn. Murray is the head of global research at Elliott Wave International. You can learn more at ElliottWave.com. And in this segment, we'll talk to him a bit about the science of socionomics. You can learn more about that at socionomics.net. So, Murray, uh, we closed the last segment with you mentioning that, you know, in the U.S. stock market, we've got this Dow theory non-confirmation going on, which really preceded the decline of 2008, also preceded the decline of 2020. Uh, You know, when you take a look at safe havens, when, when the market declines, often U.S. treasuries have been considered to be a safe haven. But when you look at the performance of long term U.S. treasuries over the last you know, three, three and a half years, you might come to a different conclusion as interest rates obviously have gone up. Uh, U.S. Treasuries have not performed well. Uh, what does your Elliott Wave analysis tell you about U.S. Treasuries moving ahead? Sure. Well, it's um, a, a little bit like um, the commodities uh 
pattern that I was talking about in the, in the initial uh, segment. So um, back in 2020 and 2021, we were alerting uh, subscribers to the fact that uh, the long-term decline in interest rates in, in bond yields was, was probably coming to an end. And um, we were certainly uh, saying uh, to subscribers in 2021, particularly with regard to the German uh, the Bund market and the U.S. Uh, Treasury market, that uh, there was a bond bear market uh, underway, uh, meaning higher yields, declining uh, prices. And of course, we had that dramatic uh, move up in, in yields uh, over the course of uh, the last few years. So interestingly, that, that's, that initial movement has probably come to an end uh, right now. Uh, and in fact, last September, uh, just before the yield started coming down, uh, we'd noticed a, a, a particular pattern, uh, another ending diagonal, as I mentioned earlier, with regards to uh, the dollar. It was uh, an ending diagonal in the German bond market, and we uh, alerted s subscribers to the fact that probably bond yields in general, three-year treasuries as well, uh, you know, would, would come down. That's happened. So this initial movement down in yields from over the last few months um, we think that is uh, just the first wave of uh, a correction lower in yields, um, meaning that uh, once this correction lower in yields is is over, we'll have another uh, movement higher in yields, um, probably quite similar to the one we've seen, uh, one we saw from 2020 to uh, 2023. Okay, well, uh, where do you see then if the stock market's correct? Uh, you know, if I'm uh, interpreting what you're saying correctly, you expect that you know bonds could actually, after this uh, this counter trend correction, uh, probably go lower, yields go higher. You could also see stocks go down. Uh, do you think we'll have commodities then as the as the best place to be for 2024? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Um, yes, I mean certainly uh, some some commodities, uh, as I mentioned, uh, things like gold would be you know a good uh, place to be. Um, you know, cash. It, 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 whenever the stock market is, is is going down, you know you can't really uh, get much better than, than than cash. And and people say, well, you know, certainly uh, up until recently they've said, well, you know, I, I get I get nothing in cash, I get zero percent or one percent in cash. Obviously, that's better now. You're getting, you know, five percent in a T bill or four, you know, four and a half in a T bill. Um, but the way to, well, the way we look at it is, uh, if you actually uh, took a chart of the stock market when it's going down, and you you flipped that on its head and you inverted that, um, that actually is your uh, return on your cash. Because as the stock market is going down, obviously your cash is becoming more valuable to eventually buy, it can buy more stocks. Um, and so that's the way we, we look at uh, returns on cash. So, yeah, I mean, cash cash would be a good place to be. Uh, some, you know, corporate bonds, you know, they're, um, they probably have, it's going to be a, a quite a stable year, I think, for bond yields. There'll be a sort of up and a down uh, sideways movement in bond yields. So, you know, um, short dated corporate bonds could be a, a good place to look at as well. But obviously being cognizant of the fact that uh, of uh, potential, you know, um, shakeouts in, 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 in credit, um, because certainly this year is going to be a challenge for many corporates as they face this kind of wall of um, maturing debt over this year and the course of the next couple of years. They funded themselves uh, at basically you know, free money uh, during the pandemic, and now that debt is maturing. So they have to they have to roll over that debt at much higher interest rates. And so um, a lot of people are kind of hoping for uh, interest rates to come down this year. So if they don't, if they stable, if they stay stable, um, much like we're kind of expecting, then it's going to be a big challenge for corporates. Um, and you know we've already got default. Rates moving up in, in in corporate bonds and junk bonds, so we wouldn't be surprised to see that happening. So I would certainly say to um, to listeners that uh, if you are investing in corporate bonds, to be very uh, careful about the credit. And actually, just on that note, I mean, with, obviously, with um, you know bonds being back as a viable 
uh, investment uh, alternative to the stock market. Uh, we've at Elliott Wave International just launched a, a new uh, product uh, aimed at people interested in, in bond and money markets, um, and it's called uh, Global Rates and Money Flows. So, you know, please, listeners, go to uh, ElliottWave.com to find out uh, more about it. And I should add, I go to ElliottWave.com frequently and uh, uh, subscribe, and I would encourage the listeners to do that as well. Murray, in the time we have left, uh, socionomics is something so unique to what it is that you do. Could you take just uh, a little bit of time here and just explain what socionomics is, and we'll get into some of the trends that you see. Of course. Well, uh, so Robert Prechter's socionomic theory uh, stems from evidence that it's the trend in social mood that determines social actions, uh, not the other way around, as most people think. So most people would think that if something negative happens, then the mood of society then turns negative. Uh, but socioeconomic studies that uh, we've done over the decades suggest that it's the, the negative mood trend comes first before the negative action. Uh, and of course, vice versa for positive action. So, for example, you know, conventional thought would be that um, recessions cause business people to be cautious, whereas the socioeconomic way of putting it would be that it's cautious business people who cause recessions. So because the, the social mood is the driver of everything, it tends to show up first in the stock market. And so the trends in stock markets can anticipate social actions. Uh, and also social actions can help us anticipate where we are in the, in the stock market cycle. So now the thing is, there's always going to be a mix of characteristics in society. And so we have to be cognizant of that when concluding what social mood is, is really doing. Well, thank you for that, Murray. And, and based on uh, that explanation, um, what are what what would be one or maybe maybe two of the things that you're seeing um, from a socioeconomics perspective that uh, we might see as emerging trends in 2024? Well, um, what's interested us over the last uh, 12 months as the uh, social mood in the U.S. has been quite positive, and you can tell that by the fact that the stock market is, is going up. The stock market is going up has been driven by, uh, you know, a positive social mood. And you had this uh, incredible uh, year of uh, Taylor Swift. So, um, you know, you can put her music in the genre of light pop. And what usually happens is that uh, light pop, uh, kind of fluffy pop, tends to be in favour at market tops um, when, when it's been driven by positive social mood. Uh, and you can think of things like the Beatles in the, in the mid-60s uh, when there was a stock market top there, uh, and the Spice Girls. Uh, in, in the late 1990s, you know, running up <laughs> yeah. that top in the uh, in the 2000 top, um, and it flips. Uh, you know, when when we get uh, bear markets, uh, bear markets are driven by negative mood, and uh, and that's when you get uh, darker genres becoming popular, such as punk in the 70s and and, and heavy metal. Uh, you know, so uh, from that regard, if if we're correct and the stock market is going to um, you know, go down, then we would expect uh, darker uh, musical genres to uh, emerge. Um, so the other, the other development that's uh, been interesting us recently in terms of socioeconomics was um, the fact that the uh, far right party in, in Germany, the uh, AFD party in Germany, they won, uh, won its first uh, mayoral election in a city, um, and that is, you know, a function of the fact that uh, social mood has been negative um, for the last 24 years, certainly in, in, in Germany. I mean, the, the German stock market is around the same level it was 24 years ago. And if you look at things like Spain and Italy, they're, they're far lower than they were, um, you know, over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, so, you know, bear markets have been going on a lot in Europe, and that's why you've had you get this negative mood 
that drives politics towards the fringes and you get this rise of populism and the kind of far right. But perhaps, uh, Dennis, the, the, the biggest thing for this year that's really interesting us uh, in terms of socioeconomics is um, what could happen in China. So uh, a couple of years ago, at the beginning of 2022, we noticed um, a, a price pattern in the Russian stock market. And uh, we actually said to subscribers in February, uh, the early February 2022, we said that this, uh, because it was coming into the point of, of you know, uh, peak negative social mood, we said that it was probably a um, uh, high probability that, that Russia would, would actually go into uh, Ukraine, whereas at the time most people were thinking, well, they probably wouldn't. Um, now, the same price pattern, a, a very long-term triangle, uh, is, is to be specific, is has emerged uh, over the last um, decade or so in China. And so we're coming into that point of this price pattern where, neg where this negative social mood, which has been driving the bear market in China uh, since 2007, is coming into its kind of peak. So um, from that regard, purely from a socioeconomic point of view, uh, we could say that uh, we would expect increasingly negative uh, social actions from China. And of course, Taiwan springs to mind. Um, and, you know, perhaps I'm just, you know, guessing here it's a year of a US election. They might take their opportunity when the US uh, has the eye off the ball. But uh, that's just conjecture. What is important is really the price pattern in China. And it's saying that uh, there's a really high probability of negative social actions. Well, my guest today has been Mr. Murray Gunn. He is the head of global research at Elliott Wave. The website is elliottwave.com, and the Socionomics website is socionomics.net. Murray, thank you for joining us today. Love to have you back down the road. I always get great feedback when you're on the program. So, again, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure, Dennis. Thank you. We will return after these words. You are listening to Retirement Lifestyle Advocates Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to listen in today, and thanks again to my special guest on today's program, Mr. Murray Gunn, for joining me. You know, in the first segment of today's program, I talked about the fact that a lot of the economic data is a lot different than reported when you drill down and look at the details. We talked about the Consumer Price Index in the first segment, and I was, as I was running out of time, I started to talk about the jobs report. In October and November, there were 71,000 jobs that were revised downward. In other words, these were jobs that were reported as being created during those months. And later, they were revised downward. So essentially, the government said these jobs were created. And later, they said, whoops, no, they weren't. So there were 216,000 jobs that were created, according to the December labor report. We don't know how many of those will actually stick once the anticipated downward revision happens. Now, one of the things when you drill into these jobs numbers that becomes pretty apparent is that these are not necessarily high-paying private sector jobs. 52,000 of these 216,000 jobs were government jobs. Now, certainly government jobs pay people. Uh, government jobs are necessary. But the important thing to remember is that for government jobs to be funded, there has to be production in the private sector so that production can be taxed to pay for government jobs. Uh, that is, if we do not want to operate with an operating deficit, although that argument is one that we don't hear too often anymore. 59,000 of these 216,000 jobs were in healthcare and social assistance, and 22,000 of these jobs were in food services. Now, these are not the kind of jobs, even though these jobs are necessary, these jobs are important, these are not the kind of jobs that create new wealth and create abundance. Now, in addition, there are 4.2 million workers that are employed part-time for economic reasons. 
This represents individuals who prefer full-time employment but are working part-time because their hours have been cut or they can't find full-time work. There are 8.5 million multiple job holders. These are people who work more than one job because a single job doesn't pay the bills. These are typically low-level service jobs, often filled by people with low-level skill sets, and yet these are the kind of jobs that we're seeing being created. These are important jobs. They're great entry-level jobs. They're great jobs for students. But they are not the types of jobs, as I mentioned, that drive the economy forward. These types of jobs certainly don't offer opportunities for American workers to get ahead. And these types of jobs do not equip workers with the cutting-edge skills they need to move on and do better. And they certainly don't pay the higher wages that are needed to fuel an economy that's dependent upon consumer spending. Now, Treasury, excuse me, uh, the, the Treasury Secretary, yes, uh, Janet Yellen pointed out in recent comments that wage growth is outpacing inflation. See, according to the government statistics, hourly war earnings rose 4.1% for the year, but inflation came in at 3.4%. In fact, Ms. Yellen said this, quote, wage increases are running over price increases now. American workers are getting ahead and the progress for the middle income families is very noticeable. Perhaps she even pounded the podium as she delivered those remarks. Now, the reality is that American workers have fallen behind. When you look at the Chapwood Index, which, as I talked about in the first segment, is a private index that tracks the cost of consumer items, you see that the annual inflation rate nationally is around 12% per year. David Stockman, who is the former director of the Office of Management and Budget, recently said this, the cost of living has risen 25% more than average hourly wage. And that is reality. The reported economic data doesn't necessarily report reality. So in other words, American workers have taken a pay cut over the past three years, and we now have almost two out of three American households actually living paycheck to paycheck. So despite the reported inflation numbers, despite the higher retail sales numbers, despite the reported job numbers, the economic reality is what it is. And now there is likely more inflation to come, in my view, given what the Fed policy will likely be moving ahead. Now, to that end, I'd like to invite you to get a couple of free resources. I have for you my 2024 forecast issue of my January special report. It's yours absolutely free by visiting the website requestyourreport.com. The 2024 forecast will give you my, my forecast for stocks, for bonds, for gold, and for the U.S. economy, give you some ideas as to what you might think about doing with your nest egg moving ahead. And when you request that report, I'll also send you a copy of the revised version of my 2024 uh, revenue sourcing book. Also, if you would like to get our Precious Metals Buyer's Guide to potentially protect yourself from inflation, you can get that at plpmetals.com. That's Papa Lima Papa Metals.com. Again, just let me know where to mail that Precious Metals Buyer's Guide, and I will be very glad to do so. That's our program for this week. Hope you got something you can use. I will be back again next week. <music> 